All right, we made it to the end. Uh, my name's Corey Quinn of the Quinn Advisory Group, where we tend to solve exactly one problem. Uh, my AWS bill is horrifying, and I don't want to turn off things I'm using. If that's you, we should talk. Uh, please feel free to tweet at me. Uh, before I get into this, does anyone here work at Docker? Oh, thank God. Okay. Um, who here runs Docker in production? That used to be something I made fun of people for, but that as of the, since the last time I gave this talk, all of the bugs in Docker have been fixed. It is now a best practice to run it in production everywhere for everything. If you're not doing that, you're doing it wrong. Um, now that this talk has been rendered completely irrelevant, I'm not going to talk about Docker anymore today. This talk is now called The Time My Boss Destroyed a Cubicle. And this is a completely true story. Uh, let me take you back in time about 10 years to my first Linux sysadmin job. Uh, my new boss had just started. And he was doing everything right. He was dressing to the nines, he was working out, and he wanted to make a strong first impression. Given the title of this story, I can safely say that he did. One morning, we're at the office and we hear the strangest sound we hear a shooka, 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 poof, from the next cubicle over. At which point we prairie dog up to take a look at what we saw and, well, let me back up. In order to understand what we looked at, it helps to understand what made the noise in the first place. In order to get in shape a little bit more effectively, my boss was drinking a lot of slim fast shakes. He was also trying to stay awake and drinking a lot of coffee. And like any good ops person, you want to optimize these things. So he started mixing the two of them together inside of a sealed Tupperware container that didn't have a valve on it. Here's a little known fact. If you remember nothing else from the rest of this conference, you can take this one home with you. Slimfast powder mixed with coffee will generate a lot of pressure buildup. It's not going to hurt anyone, but it is going to blow the lid off of the container. So yeah, that catches us up to where we left off in the story. So we're peering over the cubicle walls and we see a disaster area, all over his clothes, all over his desk, all over his computer, and of course, all over himself. And he stands there with the most forlorn, dismayed, and embarrassed look on his face and a year later, when I left that job, the chocolate blast ring was still there, and no one would ever tell anyone where it came from. So, fun story, but what's the point? How is it relevant to anything? I mean, at its heart, all it is is a story about how someone didn't quite understand containers and how it might have an interesting failure mode in production. And there's the metaphor. Okay, so let's go back to the Docker talk for a few minutes. Uh, my point in this talk is not to make fun of Docker. It's to discuss some of the challenges that I've seen and that I've experienced myself with getting it into production. Every technology needs skeptics, and I should point out that I have used Docker myself in other talks I've given as a part of demos. Uh, this talk isn't going to have any demos because the TSA confiscated my Tupperware container. So. Let's talk about why Docker in production poses some challenges. Uh, before we get to why it's terrible, let's talk about what it is. Docker serves as a relatively new container technology that Fortune 100 companies are going nuts over like 18-year-olds on spring break. Why? It's because Docker is not only the best container technology out there, it is the first ever operating system level container solution. This has never been done before. Well, except for LXC, which was uh, it's been in the Linux kernel now for over a decade. But Docker does leverage it, so we're going to count it. And Solaris zones go back almost as far, which Docker doesn't leverage. The funny thing is, between the first time I gave this talk and now, someone created a pull request that was merged in. Docker now supports Solaris zones. It's almost a point now of life imitating art. Uh, so yeah, this tends to be a little bit of a hit or miss uh, approach. Uh, 
And I guess we're also gonna call jails a form of containers as well. And if they count, change routes have been in Unix since 1982. And then you wind up with change routes on steroids in the form of OpenVZ or Virtuoso. And at that point, you have management tools baked into it. So we're starting to get a little bit closer. And if you're gonna count that, you wind up as well with logical partitions. They have mainframes from the 70s. And virtualization, of course, is also a giant technology that's trying to do very similar things. Uh, for anyone who were, wasn't that in tech back in there in the noughties, uh, before we had Docker, 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 we had cloud, 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 and before that was vert, 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 all the things. Hype evangelists aren't new creatures. They tend to wind up uh, just changing form. All of which leads us to Vagrant, which is probably the closest analog we have to Docker, at least in terms of the mean time to dopamine effect. In other words, I want to write some code, so I do it, and now I want to run and test it. And it does that very quickly. But I think at this point, I do have to concede, Docker is not the first player in this space. So if it's not the first, what makes it different? What explains all of the hype around Docker? Completely unrelatedly, I'm sure the $180 million in funding that Docker's received over uh, four or five rounds of funding now from these 10 investors had nothing to do with any of the hype. But the trouble isn't Docker itself. The technology is valid. It's new, but it's awesome. The challenge is, or starts to be what Docker represents. Does anyone remember a three-tiered architecture of your systems? Uh, this is something you used to see a lot back in the Stone Age, also known as three years ago before the Great War. You had different tiers of systems. You knew where everything lived. Oh, the application server winds up having a problem. I know where that is and I know where to, how it talks to the rest of the systems. I'll go take a look at it. Nowadays, if you draw a diagram like this in a job interview, the interview ends early and they never call you again. Now with Docker, we're moving a bit more towards a microservices-based architecture, where things live wherever they want, there's no determinism around where things are going to be placed, and there's no guarantee that you're going to wind up with containers moving around from time to time. Unfortunately, it would seem that going with a microservices-based architecture is not going to necessarily save you from yourself, but it is going to let you kick the can down the road a few years until the next thing comes out. It buys you time. I'm going to stop here for a minute and talk for a minute about what a microservice is. Uh, a lot of people tend to nod very sagely when they start talking about what this looks like, but don't actually know what it means. Like me, back when I was building this talk. Microservices, more than anything else, are really the church of Docker. This is what it's working towards. And what makes this fun is that there's not a universal definition that applies to all of them. But they do start to have some common characteristics that you can sort of pick and choose from. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. But the idea is that instead of one giant monolith for your application, you wind up breaking it down into independent processes. And the communication points between those processes tend to take the form of stabilized and versioned API calls. This means that you wind up with a very modular system. So if you have a microservice that's sole job is to take a input of a product ID and then spit out the number of those products that you have in inventory, that means that what you do under the hood of that process can change completely. Instead of, uh, if I want to change the database over from MySQL to Oracle, I want to rewrite the thing in Scala instead of in Python and then drown myself in a toilet when all of that is done, the interface to the rest of the application isn't going to change. So I don't care about that new service and what's under the hood. The application continues to speak to it. So I can roll out the new version, I can fall back to the old version, and the rest of the application, and thus the rest of the world, doesn't notice or care. They also tend to be environmentally agnostic to a point where as long as you view your servers as just piles of resources, things like CPU, RAM, disk, you can cohabitate different containers doing different things on the same box as long as the resources become available. You stop caring so much about the physical world and start thinking more in terms of the abstraction. And the great bonus that starts to add business value here is that you can now break up your ever larger engineering teams into smaller groups to focus on different microservices. 
So you have a team of developers that instead of working on everything all at once, you now can have them broken into subgroups. Uh, this solves the problem that you see in businesses as they scale. A group of whales is called a pod, a group of ravens is called a murder, and a group of developers is called a merge conflict. It tends to not end as well as you'd hope. This is not an exhaustive list, obviously, of all of the different characteristics of microservices. Uh, some people who sometimes like to advocate that, well, it's only a microservice if it's under 100 lines of code, which is great. You're wrong, but okay. By that theory, I have a bash script that qualifies as a microservice because it's 800K and only one line due to the magic of semicolons. As an added bonus, Git Blame becomes a fun game called Who Touched It Last? And the last benefit of microservices is that your whiteboard diagrams and of architecture start to look a lot like this, which is a lot more impressive when you have an audience and you're trying to draw something out. It's complex, it's interesting, it's confusing, and it gets deeper. Strapping a microservices architecture into your existing servers as they are today generally doesn't tend to work. It ex you expect certain things. You expect to be able to control your environment via a series of API calls, add yourself to a load balancer, take yourself out of the load balancer. Uh, so you have to run something underneath it, between it and the metal, that starts to understand these things. Uh, for example, like OpenStack, or which runs on complexity, or AWS, which runs on money. Uh, this is, and I'm not making this up, an official OpenStack architecture diagram. This is why you'll see me in the bar right after the conference. So now you've got this layer of unclear complexity riding on top of another layer of unclear complexity, all in the name of building a modern systems architecture. And that's sad. I mean, what have we come to? What is the state of DevOps now? Weep for where we've come, and weep for the sad puppy with coffee and slim fast stuck in his fur semi-permanently. How do we get here? The selling point and the promise of Docker and why developers leapt at it was that it makes development look just like production. The original problem it solved was how do I make my late model MacBook Pro look just like an EC2 instance or a server sitting somewhere? It's great, because finally we solved the silo problem. This is the old school method before DevOps even. We're, we're all DevOps here, right? That, that's a legitimate job title for all of us. The way that it works now is that you have developers working inside of the container, and then they don't have to think about production ever again. They can throw it over to ops, just like a container on a container ship. The shipping company doesn't care if those containers are full of electronics or grain or puppies. It doesn't matter. They treat the containers all the same way. The challenge, of course, is that somewhere along the way, we forgot to build roads. The promise is that it makes development and production look the same. It's flawless. It's identical, it just works. I've solved the just works on my machine problem. Well, good for you, back up your laptop because it's going to production. Now we can start getting things out there. Except, you don't have to schedule containers on your laptop. They're just on your laptop. So whether you're using Kubernetes or Mesos or Docker Swarm, it's great, you start having to think about that. And those are all complex and really heavy, and there's no, not a lot of consensus out, that, out there, and some very specific companies are very interested in how those discussions tend to unfold in the future. On top of that, you have networking, and credit where due, Docker networking has come a long way in the past year. You don't see a whole lot of people talking about it anymore, and I'm willing to almost concede at this point that the general latency problems have now been licked. Now the I.O. problems are moving to the disk, which is a whole separate cuddle of wax. But I still don't necessarily have to think about networking anymore on my laptop, especially since Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows came out. It all just works. In production, I don't have that luxury. In most traditional deployments, forget Docker for a second, you don't generally just knife switch cut over to brand new things whenever you release a new version of your code, if you're, unless you're being a little out there. Generally, you tend to phase changes in and out once you're at sufficient scale, where you ideally wind up having a small subset of your nodes running the new code. You instrument them heavily to start looking at different failure cases. This is called canary analysis. 
and it works reasonably well. That works awesomely, in fact, right until you get to a point where your latest code change now requires a schema change. So now you have to worry about feature toggles or you need to schedule downtime to do an update, and that's, gonna ba that's going to sort of have a problem with getting that done out in the traditional way you do deploys. Now, this is solvable. In fact, most people have already solved this in one way or another in their environment. The challenge is, is that it, your, all of your old release processes that you've been using until now sort of go out of the window when you're considering rolling out Docker. And the, those processes and the constraints you used to work under are now obsolete. So instead, you get to reinvent this, and in development, it doesn't matter, because when you want to try the new version of your code, you stop the container, start the new one, and life goes on. Now we're getting into the heart of some of the differences. Uh, has anyone here ever successfully monitored an immutable infrastructure and lived to tell the tale? It becomes an interesting challenge. Uh, specifically, instrumenting your application for intermittent problems becomes a whole kettle of interesting. How do you get meaningful metrics or information about that problem when the container it happened on 20 minutes ago has since been decommissioned and it stood up somewhere else? You, you've got to hope on some level that you're recording enough information from these to reproduce the problem and figure out what went wrong. Uh, also, spoiler, Docker host names are random inside of the container. Every time it winds up spinning up again, it self-identifies as something else, which is going to make Nagios really interesting if that's the model you're approaching monitoring with. Tied closely to monitoring as well is the idea of supervision. Uh, process supervision and container supervision are interesting things. Sometimes processes die. And there's a whole giant conflicting pile of tooling that's designed to make sure that that doesn't happen, or when they do, they come back quickly. Uh, you wound up with upstart, you wound up with system D that's slowly eating the world and everything in it, and Docker as well does to keep a look at the process that's running. If it dies, so does the container, which can be what you want, but often it's not. So you have system D doing this, you have supervisor D or things like it doing it, and the challenge is, is whatever you wind up doing inside of your container to manage this, if you want things to behave a certain way, means that as you make your different decisions at each level of this stack, you're rapidly approaching a unicorn where no one else has made the same decisions that you have at every step. Every step. So if you have the same problem as someone else, it's probable that they're running something entirely different and you're not going to be able to learn from other people's mistakes. And now, however many slides in we are, we finally get to the idea of managing configuration in an immutable world at PuppetConf. Docker is increasingly seeing themselves in many ways as configuration management. They're wrong. Uh, for example, I have a container that I wrote in development. We've signed off on it. Now we're running it in staging. Things are great. Now we move it to production. Which database is it talking to in each one of those? How does it wind up getting that information from its environment? Do you wind up running a config management agent such as Puppet inside of your Docker container? Uh, please say no to that one. That, that's not how we envisioned the world going. You wind up with the idea of having to potentially orchestrate things around it. You wind up having configuration management work in interesting ways around the Docker environment. But inside of it, there's a whole series of open question marks there. And Things like registration of instances, deregistration of ephemeral stuff is, gets hard. If you wind up with a bunch of containers that are spawning, they register themselves with Puppet, then they turn themselves off, you wind up with a serious problem of what's in my environment. It becomes increasingly challenging. And throwing everything away to just, oh, we're going to go ahead and do this differently now, it means that we're throwing out an awful lot of things. And whatever you pick, be careful, because you still have that whole rolling deployment idea a little bit earlier in the stack. This starts to speak to an idea of service discovery, where containers need to be able to find each other. They need to be able to find different resources in their environment. They need to figure out, well, where the master database lives, but not just that. They need to get access to what the credentials are to talk to it. You don't usually want to bake those into a container that's going to wind up living in a bunch of different places you wind up having a bunch of options in this space of key value systems. You've got console, Zookeeper, Redis, 
Mongo, etcd, the time I abused MySQL so badly, I'm still not allowed within 500 yards of a database. Uh, you went up with Surf, Doozerd, DNS, Hira, and the list continues to go on. None of these systems are themselves straightforward. All of them have failure modes in this context that become interesting and challenging, and you have to solve for it. Let's keep climbing Mount Hopeless. You've built an awesome container somewhere in your environment. Good job. Now you need to put it somewhere where I, as an ops person, can safely stuff it into production. And this one gets interesting, because as part of one of their early business models, Docker does offer private registry hosting, which is great. Their, their pricing model was very reasonable, taking the GitHub model. If you want private registries, here you go. Starts at $150 a month. That was great. That's a very reasonable answer. And then Amazon saw, ah, that seems like an interesting model. And they started offering the same effective service at 10 cents a gigabyte per month, which effectively eviscerates that as a serious scalable business model. At 10 cents a gig, it's effectively free, it scales linearly, and I don't have to worry about it in quite the same way. The challenge there is that Docker is still trying to figure out what's going on, and I don't have a problem with that. That's great. These people do. And this is the problem with trying to build a number of different models around this. You have companies like Amazon who are out there playing to break even, not playing to win. It becomes difficult to compete with things becoming rapidly commoditized here. Let's go back to the tech for a minute. We're almost out of room in the slide, which means ideally this metaphor is almost exhausted. But if another group in my company or another company entirely hands me a Docker container, it is very difficult for me to audit that container, by which I mean, how was it built? What libraries are contained inside of it that I may care about very soon? And is it built in a reasonable way? If I grab a container to run MongoDB to prove something off of the, do the public Docker hub, that may work very well for development, but do I, not just did they build it properly, do I agree with the decisions they made while building it? Um, how does it wind up making sense in my environment? Uh, one of the nice things about a lot of these technical conferences is that there's always a great discussion around how to properly build containers. And what's great is, is that we've had a consensus emerge. All of the other talks about how to build containers are wrong. Pay attention to this one, which is nice, but not remotely helpful. So all I have to go on at this point is my developer says, shut up, it's fine, and we're back into a place where I have no real idea what's running in my environment and is going to wake me up at three o'clock in the morning. And that tends to represent itself as a bit of a failure of the trust model. All of which, of course, ties directly into security, which completes this list. Uh, I put at the end of this process because security is generally something that you can just bolt on after the fact once you've built everything, and you don't have to worry about that. You know, a few people are laughing at that. I told that joke at RSA. Nobody laughed. But let's pretend that a new SSL vulnerability comes out. And the next heart bleed, for example. Third-party containers are everywhere in your environment. Some of them came from the official Docker Hub, some came from vendors, and some, well, Ted wrote that, but Ted took another job eight months ago. Which ones were patched? How do you patch them? How do you wind up auditing this? At least the official Docker public repositories have gotten to a point where there's a security auditing system on there that now flags things when these big breaches come out, which is helpful, but it does cause a bit of a challenge. For example, I have a horribly vulnerable container that I use for some demos. Its name, and I'm not making this up, is Terrible Ideas. I'm sure someone somewhere for some godforsaken reason is running that in production just because. I don't wanna have to think about that. So there you have it. A giant list of things that apply in production that aren't going to apply in your development environment. And by the time you've solved for each one of these, it's almost entirely a given that your environment is now unique. The nice thing about things that make sense, Puppet is a great example of this. If I'm seeing a strange behavior in my environment, 
I can reach out to other people using Puppet, because I can make certain assumptions. There's probably more than one person running the version that I'm running. There's probably someone who knows what that error that just popped up means. There's probably someone who has solved whatever I'm trying to do already. And I don't have to go through every level of this figuring out what the differences are. No one is likely to have made the exact same technology choices that you made at each of these. And it just becomes a difficult problem. You get to diagnose where everything comes in when things break. Or, God forbid, someone reports it's slow. Or there's this problem intermittently happening. It becomes very challenging to isolate that. And all of this addresses a great myth that I wanted to bring up. There's a lot of, this is the kind of problem solving and architecting for tremendous scale that Google, Facebook, Netflix, Twitter, they're all famous for doing this. They write lots of white papers, they hire very eloquent speakers, and we all are led to believe that these companies have figured out the one true way to answer all of these problems. And the problem is that they haven't because their constraints that they're working under are not the constraints that the rest of us have to work under. The solutions that they come up with have solved for their problems, not our problems. Uh, Netflix wrote a tremendous pile of tooling around AWS, not entirely because they thought they knew better than everyone else, but because at the time they started this, Amazon's tooling themselves around these things that they provided wasn't up to the task, so they had no choice. When Google launches a new product, whatever it may be, and it doesn't really matter because they'll kill it in less than 18 months, they're going to wind up on day one having 10 million concurrent users of it. Most of us don't have to solve for that problem. Their constraints aren't our constraints, is my point. And here at the end, we really get to why this talk is relevant at a configuration management conference. Purely immutable infrastructure on one side and purely uh, configuration managed infrastructure on the other are not a binary decision. It becomes a spectrum. I don't know anyone who is running a completely immutable infrastructure. There is always something, even at the very bleeding edge, that has to be managed in traditional and reasonable ways. I also don't know anyone on the other side of the spectrum who has no golden images of any kind. Every system winds up being built uniquely in its own way using Puppet or whatever else you want to use on top of that. There is always some form of middle ground that, that we wind up settling on. And is the world moving towards immutable? Absolutely. Does that mean that there's no place for configuration management? Not even close. And the real challenge that you wind up seeing here is that after the talk I've given and talking to people over the uh, past few days of this conference, does anyone think that going ahead and replacing your monolith with a microservices architecture is just gonna be a quick drop-in replacement? It's effectively an issue of paying off technical debt to some extent where you wind up making a decision to have to potentially do a feature freeze for a few months while you rewrite a bunch of things and re-architect it. That doesn't often make sense for most companies. On the other side, if you're building something greenfield because you're a, one of two founders of a startup, great. Are you going to invest the time, energy, and I guess discipline into building the entire thing from microservices perspective? It may not make a whole lot of sense for you. You don't even know if your product is going to be around in three months. There, the world is full of stories of companies that built something horrifying, but it worked then they went back and fixed it later. The world is also full of people who were pedantic about how it was architected, their code quality was superb, and they built a beautiful, glorious failure. You also wind up with a fun story around a lot of things that we take for granted don't work in containers in the same way. Um, for example, if you take RabbitMQ, you run it in a Docker container, you start putting messages into the queue. You've mounted a volume to have it store its data so it can survive the end of that container. Great, awesome. You stop the container. You launch another container mounting the same volume and your data is gone. Because the way that RabbitMQ works under the hood is it reads and writes to files in its disk persistence mode that are identified by host names. Host names are random. Can you fix this? Absolutely, it's not that hard, but it's an example of all of the implicit 
assumptions that go into the way that the software we write and the tooling that we use think about systems. Turning all of that on its head becomes a little bit of an exercise in exploration. I do want to give thanks to a few people for this. Uh, this, this slide was built on a tweet by uh, Michael Ducey, who tweeted out originally after Julian Dunn drew it out. Uh, I didn't see the original tweet, so the first time I gave this talk, it was difficult for me to uh, track it down because this is the version that I saw. It, thanks also go to Tyler Fitch, who works at Chef, for helping me track this stuff down. They tend to contribute interesting and occasionally useful things to the ecosystem. We all tend to be stronger together. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, the last thanks I want to give out is to a friend of mine, uh, Mike Julian, who I was telling the story of the exploding container to in a bar a, uh, about almost a year ago. And he convinced me that it would make a, the foundation for a terrific talk. I was a little skeptical, but he twisted my arm into it. Uh, his O'Reilly book, a Practical Monitoring, is coming out soon. Feel free to read it. It explains monitoring in a way that some moron in a suit can understand, which is relevant to my interests. And lastly, I want to thank all of you for sticking around for the last track and listening to me talk. Uh, this is me. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, any questions or concerns, please feel free to ask me now. You can tweet at me or accost me in the parking lot after the conference if you're really into containers. Thanks.